welcome to a special edition of The Point with me, Lu Xin. It's a roundtable edition, and today we're going to talk about the Chinese model. Now, in the past 40 years or so, China has pulled off some amazing feats with its uh, unique economic model, transforming itself from an isolated country to the world's second largest economy. China's economy may no longer grow at the dazzling speed it used to today. However, it's still seen as a major growth engine for the global economy as recovery around the world still moves in fits and starts. Some say China will continue to wave the magic wand to boost world economic growth. Yet others are more skeptical about this, claiming there are bubbles in China's eco economic prosperity which will eventually burst, leading to a devastating collapse. Does either of these assumptions hold water? Joining me for this special di roundtable discussion is uh, Claire Pearson, ex-chair of the British Chamber of Commerce in China, now with DLA Piper Law Firm. Xi Qingduo, a current affairs commentator, our old friend, and our new friend, Berli Lani Jili, a Yenching scholar at Peking University studying international relations and public policy. So, first of all, welcome to all of you. Before we start the discussion, um, maybe a, a, a quick look at some interesting figures, important figures, I would say, which uh, can highlight the achievements China has made over the past uh, five years, or let's say past 40 years. Mm -hmm. 75, 30 percent, and 700 million. Could you guess what these might represent? <laughs> I guess that's too big. 700 million? Out of poverty. Out yeah. of poverty. Okay, yeah. that was easy. 30 percent? Um, economic growth to the con contribution to the global economic growth? Contribution? 30 percent? Mm. Yeah. That's around mm. that. Mm. Um, close, yeah, mm. close. 75? Mm, I think the uh, Chinese economy has uh, grown seven times multiple itself, right? Sorry? 75 times the Chinese economy has grown of itself, right? Bingo. Mm. I think each one of you got one. <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah. If you want yeah. one out. We're all still on. We're all still on. <laughs> still on. Wow. Great yeah. yeah. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Yes. Let's, let's, let's break them up. For instance, uh, the first one really is about China's economic growth. Wow. You see from the charts, in 1978, mm. China's uh, GDP was uh, mm -hmm. 100, almost 150 billion. And uh, over, the, over the years, China has now uh, China stands now at the end of 2016 at 11.2 trillion US dollars. So that is indeed 75 times growth from 1978 to 2016. Statistics, uh, statistics from the World Bank. So uh, well done, Julie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next one 30%. Um, okay. Here is a quote from Chi Fuling, he's director of China Institute for Reform and Development, and he said in 2016 that the contribution of China to the world economy will remain around 3% for the next five years. But this is only looking forward. Mm -hmm. Basically, China's, China's GDP has been contributing, China's GDP growth, let me put it this way, has been contributing to world economic growth by 30%. Yes since mm. 2008. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, so we're, we're not just looking at the, the mm. past decade almost, but China is also saying in the next five years, we want and we hope to be able to do the same. The next number, 700 million exactly, I think that is uh, relatively well known. China has lifted 700 million people, 700 million, okay? <laughs> that is uh, not a small number. Out of poverty in less than 40 years, taking up over 70% of global reduction in poverty. That's uh, Chinese statistics, but again, the world uh, statistics is not far from this one. Mm -hmm. uh, I think China's achievement in poverty reduction is widely recognized mm -hmm. from all kinds of reports and sources we've seen. So, mm -hmm. uh, how, how possible has China been able to do all of that? What has been the, the magic with the so-called Chinese model? Hmm. Well, <laughs> interestingly, I think within China, if you take a look hmm. at the academic world, we, don't, we are not able yet to provide a, a reasonable theory to explain why China has been so, so successful over the hmm. past four decades. You know, it's easier to look at uh, you know, the past 
uh, kind of like, uh, let me call it theories, look, for Western developed countries, people say Washington consensus, you know, democracy, human rights, uh, market economy. But if you look at China, we, yeah, we can figure out some of the factors. You, we do have market economy, we do have a strong central government, we have a primary economy. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, somehow you cannot explain it away with those um, uh, factors. It's systematic theory. I'm yeah. not sure but we have talk that about yet. When you talk about the Chinese model, mm. what come up to your mind, for instance, Claire? Oh, just incredible hard work. I, I saw a very interesting interview once. It was with a, it was a very interesting gentleman. He'd lived mm. half his life in China, half his life in the U.S. And he was obviously a natural leader, and he'd become a mayor in both continents. Mm. And the interviewer very, uh, very diplomatically asked him, where was it more difficult to be a mayor? And he said, before I be got elected in the US, the run up to his election was extremely tiresome, extremely difficult and worrisome. But he said, when I got elected, it was a bit of a ride. Mm. But he said, in China, before my election as mayor, I just had dinner with a university <laughs> friend, pretty easy. But he said, when I was elected, my neck was on the block for the GDP of that province. Yeah, mm. tough job. I think <laughs> this is the difference in the system. Mm. This is the difference in the systems. In mm. China, you've got KPIs for your local mayors to drive the local economy. And they are directly responsible for that. And if they don't deliver, they're out. And there's no plan B. Mm. Whereas I think in the US, in the West, some of our politicians maybe they're there a little bit for the TV and the ride <laughs> and you know I mean who are our politicians they're often ex lawyers who are your politicians they're ex engineers the people who produce things <laughs> well, well the difference in China really is um, you know before you are able to sit in any leadership position you mm. have to go through years, years. Of, of working mm -hmm. in the, uh, with with grassroots yeah. people right you have to deliver you, you're, you're constantly you have to constantly provide you know that's, uh, that's reports right. for your work yeah. you, you can't just uh, jump from a lawyer, from a, yeah. a, a movie star, yeah. into a leadership position yeah. of, you know... <laughs> <laughs> a movie star, you're right, Ronald Reagan did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. In China, it's really based on, you made a good point, it's yeah. based on your performance. Mm. Your legitimacy you comes from your performance, yeah. comes from whether you deliver or not. Mm. It's not about what you said. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a bigger promise you make. No, right. that's not enough. We'll oh, take yeah. a look yeah. at your track record. <laughs> Yeah. And also, it comes back to the China model. If you look at the Chinese uh, government or speeches by Chinese officials, nobody, no documents ever mention the China model or Chinese model. It's an academic uh, term, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, mostly from Western countries. People say, oh, there, there must be a China model. Mm. <laughs> there <laughs> must be one. <laughs> <laughs> it's you. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah Julie, from, the, from your perspective? Yeah, it's, it, it is very difficult to, like, uh, make an argument that there's a specific way in which China has, you know, achieved this kind of uh, monumental formative growth. And so in some ways, um, it will be, you know, preposterous, as what we've been saying, that, that there is exactly a model, because if there was one, I, and then it will be somewhat easier to replicate. However, um, it's very much formative obvious that, um, that China is sitting in a particularly unique place in the world in which it has achieved astronomical growth. Uh, with a number of, you know, um, synergies and forces driving it in that direction. Um, and is there something, you know, uh, unique that they've done? I'd probably say no. I'd probably say they've done, you know, a number of unique things that have put them in this particular place. For right? instance, you know, you know, what is the, the biggest one that is impressive? To me, to me I think uh, the most impressive thing, you know, um, is, you know, uh, a centralized government that is able to work hand in hand with, uh, you know, the economic sector um, in a way in which I think uh, most countries don't particularly have where, you know, the central government is working directly with, you know, the economic um, uh, fields, right? to achieve growth. I wanted to, I wanted to ask Qingdu maybe mm. from the Chinese perspective, um, how can the Chinese government do the work and still regulate itself so that mm. it's not reaching too far too deep into where it shouldn't go. Mm. Well, as I said, like, um, I think for the Chinese officials, Chinese government, if you look at the Chinese history, every time there's a weak central government, the country was in trouble. So mm. a strong central government usually symbolizes a prosperity period at least. Mm. And, um, how uh, how is that? 
Well, um, this is based on experience, based on the history study. But mm. from a I cultural perspective. Yeah, uh, I, the, the culturally, you know, Confucianism, you know, we uh, pays a lot of attention to order, social order. You mm. have this uh, national leader, you have the middle level officials, mm. and uh, you then you show your respect to your uh, you upper, know, upper yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, officials up there. And then there's the order. And mm. order uh, used to be more important than law in China. Mm. So that's why we have a, a tough time basically to build this uh, rule of law in China. But of mm. course, it's still ongoing. Mm. And also, the, the, the government, you know, whether it's a dynasty you know, by a certain family or now by Chinese Communist Party, then they understand that I have to deliver. Uh, I have to perform well, otherwise people will not be happy with my ruling. So mm -hmm. I need to look inside too, look inward. That's I will regulate my own behavior mm -hmm. and my officials, uh, you know, from top down. You have to behave yourself and work for the people. Yeah. That's for the collective interest of the whole country, and, not and for yourself. And, and also the system needs to be able to re, re, readapt itself to, to mm -hmm. see the problems and to make the revisions and uh, adjust itself, yes. otherwise it's... Uh, if you, if you instead of waiting for others to, uh, by means of election or by right. means of an opposition party to, no. to you no. know... It's, it's like if you are familiar with the Chinese culture, there's also a phrase called if you are successful, uh, your ambition is really about improving everybody else, mm -hmm. to help every, everybody else. That's the top ambition of any scholar. Mm -hmm. uh, if you become the, a top official, you want to help everybody. Uh, 天下 means okay, the world and the heaven, the, the previously the China sphere. Yeah. That's it. I don't know whether people in other countries are going to follow this very, very closely, but can such a system with its uniqueness be, if not copied, at least emulated a little bit to a certain degree? Well, uh, 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 my, my experience are, are, is less philosophical, less <laughs> academic than yours. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I just work in a company and I've worked in, for the same firm in London, in Hong Kong, and then in Beijing. And there is a different management style here. We're able to make money in all three jurisdictions, but the management is different. I would call it in China a sort of collective capitalism. Mm. There's competition, but there's also concern for the individual employee because there's less of a mm. safety net, social safety net. So people are concerned to mm. keep people employed. Mm. Mm. And I actually quite like this model mm. because I feel that in other countries, they're a lot quicker to make people redundant put them on social security and then you have the inherent social issues that go with mm. social security, damage to ego, depression. Mm. And what I like about China is it does focus on maintaining full employment. It's sort of a compassionate capitalism mm. which mm. is less common in the West. Is it replicable in other countries? Yes, if, if uh, they haven't experienced something completely different before. I was working this week with friends from Ethiopia and Kenya and I could see the Ethiopian plan was very similar to the, what I would call the last Chinese five-year plan in terms of infrastructure, tertiary development, and then service sector. Mm -hmm. In Kenya, it was less, it kept the Kenyans less closely followed the China plan because they had a different historical experience. But my view is China is definitely a leader of the developing countries right now because people look at that, they say, wow, you've developed an empty continent into an economically prosperous country. Mm -hmm. How did you do that? Mm -hmm. but these are really busy leaders. They all show up for BRICS. Why do they all show up for BRICS? Because they want a slice of that. I always look, why do I work here? I listen to Sheryl Sandberg. She's quite a feminist COO. Mm -hmm. She works at Facebook. And she always said, it doesn't matter what company you join, what country you work in, but join a rocket ship. Your GDP graph, <laughs> that's the trajectory of a rocket ship. <laughs> China's mm. a rocket ship, and the people who come and work mm. here and stay here are the people who like riding a rocket ship. They mm. don't like mundanity. They like change, and they're looking at the future. Yeah. Basically, mm. where the, the, the future is. Where the, they're looking where the, the trend, future yeah, is. Yeah, where the trend is going. However, yeah. if you look at that rock, rocket ship, it's... 
uh, it's pretty clear it's not going to be like that forever, right? Mm -hmm. People okay. are already... It's a fight. Yeah. 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 It's a fight. Yeah. People are already <coughs> talking about uh, medium to, you know, um, anyway, keeping it stable but not mm. high uh, growth rate anymore. Mm. So what are some of the possible negative uh, implications of this model that people have to bear, bear in mind. Mm. Uh, it's also part of the model, I guess. You know, you, can, you simply cannot have this kind of a, mm. um, a rocket shape forever. Mm. So, mm. I'd probably say uh, one thing that is particularly uh, striking about it is that with tremendous amounts of economic growth um, comes tremendous opportunities, but also you do have issues of people who are left behind, right? Uh, and the sense of, you know, is the rocket ship taking everybody to the future and is it mm -hmm. taking everybody to kind of new economic, uh, you, know, uh, you know, opportunities. And uh, to me what's been most striking living here in China is recognizing the juxtaposition between living in a place like, you know, uh, Beijing in comparison to like Xi'an and then, you know, in comparison to places that are far more rural and recognizing that um, this, you know, a uh, country has provided numerous opportunities for a lot of people, but in some ways uh, that, you know, uh, wealth distribution has not necessarily reached to the, you know, very edges of the entire society. And I think that, like, some of these developmental issues that are appearing in China are happening because, you know, we were so focused about looking forward or looking, you know, towards the sky that we didn't necessarily immediately recognize that some people might have not necessarily prospered, right? Sure, uh, Deng Xiaoping was talking about mm. let some people get rich first, first. right? Yeah. He, but, he yeah. was but, but also, you know, mm. President Xi Jinping talked mm. about, you know, one of his priority mm. when he took his office like five years ago, roughly, mm. uh, is um, um, poverty alleviation mm. or precision poverty alleviation or target uh, mm. poverty alleviation. And what he said is like uh, nobody should be left behind. Mm. No one, no single person should be left mm. behind. Everybody should be left out of the poverty. Yeah. Mm. Uh, still, uh, we have seen problems, right? We have seen problems. Yes. For instance, environmental pollution. pollution mm. yes. Some people are saying yes. this was a byproduct of that rocket shape. <laughs> you <laughs> also <laughs> left a lot of debris. Mm. Um, how do you look at this, Claire? I mean, you are also breathing this air, right? <laughs> we have to be honest. Uh, the air mm. quality in Beijing has not been the best. Mm. It is improving, but compared with what we want, there is still a, a distance. How mm. do you look at this issue? Oh, I like something my boss said the other day. He said, if the water's too clean, the fish can't swim in it. <laughs> <laughs> you have become Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> You're very I have. Chinese. I, 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 and of course, you know, when I go to the UK, I feel more like going out and running. And when I come to Beijing, I, I still ride my bike here because. You know I what? do too. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I see that. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> I, I feel that um, the pollution is a byproduct of every industrial revolution. Mm. We had it in the UK. My dad used to go to, to the University of Manchester on a bus, mm. and he said some days we had a pea super, congee light air. Mm. You know, <laughs> he had a pea super. Mm. And so Britain had pea supers when we had jobs. Now you have jobs, you have bad air. Do you want unemployment or do you want clean air for the complainers? You know, I, I think people's self-respect and attachment to work is more important than uh, AQI of 0.2. I think the government is well aware of the pollution situation. Yeah. We are all well aware of the air. Mm. Uh, but we're also well aware of uh, the people's ego uh, and that being attached to employment. Mm. So I think there is a, a, a trade-off here that the government is dealing with. Do we just shut down all the factories in Shandong? Do we tell all the 2,000 workers in a Ningbo plant to go home? Do we close another steel plant in Beijing? Do we? Yeah, that's what Mrs. Thatcher did. Great. No coal mines, no polluting, jo no polluting jobs, but a lot of people at home with depression and no job. The country has to make that decision. Yeah. Do you want to keep the poor people happy and employed or the rich complainers with clean air? And yes, I understand the depletion of the ozone layer. I know the issue. And I feel like China is fighting it. When I, go, when I travel to the west of China, I see more wind farms than I ever do when I cross Europe. Mm. China's not scared of clean energy solutions. When I was out for dinner the other night, I met a bunch of guys and they, I said, who are you working for? They'd all come over from California because they wanted to be working for cutting edge clean tech. Mm. 
Hmm. And so their whole R&D team had relocated from California to working for a Chinese clean tech company. Mm -hmm. So cutting edge clean tech is here because none of us want to breathe congee. <laughs> um, and they're sorting it out, but don't just ask people's jobs and then wonder why we've got social issues but in clean air. <laughs> don't wonder. That's a great point, yeah. <laughs> you know, the real yeah. complainers get on TV. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, the guy grafting in the factory in Shandong is yeah. just paying his, his, mm. his for his family. Yeah, mm. but the thing is, are the two just unreconcilable? I mean, I don't know whether I used yeah. the correct I mean, word. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, the, yeah. Because when, when other countries copy the Chinese model, are they also going to copy the rocket with the rocket in, in pollution as well? Yeah, I don't yeah, think yeah. they want to do that. I, I, and I think the intersection point is, you know, attempting to find solutions that don't necessarily have the kinds of problems that we have, you know, acknowledged, which is you know, pollution. Mm -hmm. And I do think they are, you yeah, right, like green aid from the technology, uh, innovative from the uh, you know, uh, innova innovative technologies or innovative forms of entrepreneurship that ensure that, you know, we're producing mm -hmm. products that are not only commercially viable, but they also, you know, ensure that we don't necessarily degradate the, um, you know, environment any further. Um, and I think China's also doing a good job of that. You know, the reality is, is that, you know, my field of focus is, in fact, entrepreneurship, innovation, oh. and technology, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've spent a fair amount of time in, in Shenzhen and you know I, I spend a fair amount of time here also here in Beijing and talking to a number of you know young kids working at Beida and working you know um, you know in Shenzhen and, and them trying to come up with innovative technologies that do meet our contemporary moment and you would be insistently surprised that you know uh, that the, the, the technologies that are being created are not only attempting to address, you know, some of the environmental concerns that we have here, but more than anything, they're ensuring that the products that we're creating are sustainable. Um, and I think that, like, that's all that we're c predominantly concerned with is, you know, producing yeah. uh, models and forms of technology that are sustainable. I, I think yeah. the, the fact uh. that we were breathing such choking air for a period of time that mm. was particularly bad mm. also made it an, an imperative Right, mm. for the Chinese yeah. government, for yeah. the Chinese yeah. people, for everybody, yeah. yes. and also an opportunity, yeah. you know, where you have a huge market, a mm. huge need mm. for all of that. Um, looking ahead for the next five years, right. does the China model need any shifting or adjustment of direction or any particular focus they have to concentrate on? Well, uh, I would say um, is, uh, attention should be paid but more about the quality, quality mm. of life, quality of the environment. It's happiness, about people's happiness. In all the development, the ultimate goal is uh, to have a happy life for your people. Mm. I think that the priority should still be on the development and the people's happiness. <laughs> uh, shift a little bit from, say, pure pursuit of development or rapid development. I think that's the livelihood of the people. Mm. Uh, not only out of poverty, but also happy life. So we have to have that confidence in there, and the government confidence needs to. Confidence of your future. And the government needs to give people what they need to build that confidence mm -hmm. on. I mm -hmm. think that is very important. Claire, yes. what is your take for the next yes. five years? Yeah, I really like that. I, I like the focus on happiness because all my friends who work here, they're very happy when they're working, but sometimes they step outside work and maybe have a kid that's when they relocate to Vancouver. Mm. And I think that we ha China is a, f if you want a career, come to Beijing. You've got the global resource, you've got the future thinkers, mm. uh, and, and they've got the intellectual firepower to make work really interesting. Mm. But as regards quality of life, maybe uh, uh, rearing a family or whatever, people are relocating at that point. And I think that, I think balance is the word China, it really needs to be looking at, you know, a win-win for everybody and wealth redistribution. I really take your point. Just because you've got a lot more stuff doesn't mean you're happier. I mean, the happiness curve it always goes like this and then plateaus at about 30,000 USD. So mm. I always say to my friends, are oh, North Koreans unhappy? <laughs> and, and my Chinese friends always go, not until they discover South Korea. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I used to feel right. Yes. I used yeah. to feel like I was really loaded yeah. because my dad had a car, right? Yeah. Because I was at a school where I was really loaded just because my dad had a car. It was mm. a Renault 4, mm. right? But when, when I moved to another school, 
people like laugh because you've got a Renault 4 because it's a rubbish car. <laughs> so you, the thing is, in the old days, we, we only felt you only had to be happy in your village. Mm. But now we're in this global village and mm. there's global comparison. And so what I want for China is exactly what I had growing up, which is a relatively socialist environment. Mm. The UK in the 70s, when I was at school, was free good education for mm. people from not well-off backgrounds. That was me. Yeah. I was at a school where kids... I remember we had one kid and we used to call him Smelly. Mm. And my mum goes, Claire, why do you call him Smelly? And I'm like, because he smells. <laughs> and mum said, well, bring him home and we'll find out why he smells. So mum invites him home and then says, you know, do you want to uh, have a bath while you're at our house? And then I never forget, we had some hens and he stole the eggs from the hen. <laughs> and I realised... he comes from an impoverished family. He is family. just from an impoverished yeah. British family. Mm -hmm. And everybody family. was going to their school. And everyone yeah. at school yeah. is teasing him because he's I, I think poor. China, yeah, I think I, China that's has... hard. China has a um, nine-year compulsory education already, right? But right. Mm -hmm. somehow... Um, Somehow the, the demands for private schooling is, mm -hmm. is always growing. For quality education. For quality yeah. education. Again, high. quality yeah. is, yeah. is the key word. And I think, yeah. I think that's a global issue though, right? And yeah. I think that like, the recognition is that like, as the market becomes more competitive, you just need to be equipped with more yeah. uh, competitive tools in order to compete. Yeah. Um, and, I think, and I think our initial conversation was all about you know, inequality. Mm -hmm. And for me, I don't have a problem with inequality as long as there are social mechanisms that ensure that people are able to move in between the yeah, strata of society, point, right? right? Yeah. Point, and so yeah. it's all about social mobility, yeah, right? Point. And do we have you know, the institutions that allow people to you know, gain the necessary skills in order to move up the social ladders if they do wish. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's a question that I think China obviously has for itself. And obviously, um, China is obviously attempting to obviously improve the education, but it also means that they have to attempt to improve the quality, but also access, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. ensuring that it's not only about, you know, sure. kids in Great Beijing, point. right? Mm -hmm. But right. it's also right. about also kids, we, you know, living I in Xi'an and so actually forth. Actually, we have a lot of discussion, mm -hmm. right, on the, si on the Chinese yeah. social media about uh, this social mobility that appears to be stagnating, mm -hmm. where people have been poor, they will stay poor. Yes. Um, this is a big topic, not just mm -hmm. among uh, the poor, the, the less privileged people, but also among the intellectuals, mm. people yes. who in, work in the media. And again, I hope the Chinese government is heeding that problem. And again, uh, they will be creating the kind of mechanism, resources necessary to improve or not to make social inability a problem in the Chinese society. Time flies, 30 minutes, a huge topic. We have to leave it there. Mm. But many thanks. Pleasure as always. So, uh, Xi Qingdu, our current affairs commentator, Claire Pearson from uh, DLA um, Piper, a law firm, mm. and Jilly, a mm. Yenching scholar from Peking University. Mm. And that, that is it for this special edition of uh, Roundtable Discussion with me, uh, Li Xin. As always, you can follow me on Twitter or Facebook using the handle The Point with Alex. Download the application called CTTN Live or go to YouTube and look for CTTN The Point. Thanks for watching. Please stop the point.